Hey everyone, Jeremy here, host of course of the podcast and also uh, part of the team over at the Sharpest Minds Data Science Mentorship Program. And I'm here today with a really exciting episode actually. We're talking to Dylan Hadfield Minnell, who is a researcher at uh, UC Berkeley. He's actually wrapping up his PhD there where he's been studying different kinds of human machine interactions, human AI interactions. And his goal really is to figure out how humans and AIs can interact together in a way that's more positive sum. Uh, one of the concerns that comes up a lot whenever humans need to convey their preferences to AIs is that their preferences can be misinterpreted. And the more powerful an AI system is, the more damage, the more harm that misinterpretation can do. And so Dylan's focused on schemes that allow humans to communicate very efficiently with AI systems and exploring different ways in which uh, you can set up systems so that they're maximally robust. The hope here being that AIs will learn to some degree to have a healthy dose of humility and uncertainty, especially when they're going into to carry out really important actions, really consequential actions. Um, so Dylan's working on that problem. He's also more broadly interested in what's known as the AI alignment problem, how we get AIs to behave in the way that we want them to. And so I'm really excited to talk to him. He's got all kinds of great insights, including fresh perspectives on what AI alignment really means and is, uh, as well as how to build systems that are properly aligned with our values. And so really looking forward to diving into this one. I hope you enjoy the conversation and I'll see you on the flip side. Well, hi, Dylan. Thanks so much for uh, joining me for the podcast. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, you're one among a growing but still pretty small group of, of researchers focused on the question of AI safety. Uh, you have one specialization, of course, one subdomain that you're focused on. I, I'd love to get a sense from you first off of how you got there, how you came to focus on AI safety, and then what your current research looks like today. My research kind of origin story, if you will, starts off in integrated task and motion planning for robotics. Uh, so I was interested on basically how to get robots to help you with your laundry. And this involved long horizon planning and a lot of details of uh, actually um, systems building on, on that side of things. And one of the key things you have to do in building that system is, uh, in, is solving a problem called motion planning. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can solve it. A method that we've used is trajectory optimization, but motion planning is the idea of You've got your robot in one particular configuration and you've got a target configuration that you want to move it towards. Mm. Uh, and you need to figure out a sequence of joint controls that actually take you from the initial position to the target position without hitting anything. Uh, and it turns out this is a surprisingly difficult thing. And it's one of the examples of human intelligence that we kind of take for granted right. uh, in our daily lives. Um, and so to kind of make a long story short, in applying trajectory optimization to this, what you do is you specify a cost function that ranks different trajectories, different ways of getting from point A to point mm. B. And it does things like saying, going into collision is very bad, um, but also things like uh, getting there faster is good. And right. there's these trade-offs that you end up having to specify, there's these weights. Um, and in, in some of my talks, I have this example of an interface that, that shows a little bit of this, um, kind of design process that you go through where you're kind of tweaking trade-offs between how good it is to avoid collision versus how fast you want to go, let's say. Mm. Uh, and ultimately what I came to realize is that these weights are a representation of what kinds of trajectories that you want. Um, and in specifying these goals, that's really a type of programming process where we specify what types of behaviors that we want. Um, and you can see this type of paradigm in a whole bunch of different contexts for AI, where we reduce the problem of specifying what we want to some kind of reward function or score function. Yeah. Um, in the case of reinforcement learning, this is something like a metric or a reward function. In the case of supervised learning, this is an empirical loss function on a data set. Um, and th there's lots of other examples that you can come up with where, where we're really encoding our preferences into um, these ranking functions, these types of utility functions, and then using general purpose methods to optimize them. Uh, and so that is, it's so after working on those problems and becoming familiar with this paradigm after about two years or so, that I began to pivot my research into studying well, actually what this problem looks like and what does it mean to actually do it well? And what are the pitfalls that we can try to avoid? That is what I view as the value alignment problem in artificial intelligence. 
Okay, so broadly understood, um, coming, so, so your, your picture of the value line problem includes coming up with the, the parameters that we want optimized. Is that fair to say? Like it, it includes that loss function. Right, I mean, in a way you can think about loss functions as a type of programming language mm. um, where we can see optimization as a compiler where you go from one representation of uh, say a classification behavior a mapping from pixels to uh, binary zero one cat right. and dog. Um, ultimately there's some set of behaviors, some set of weights that, that represent classifying things appropriately. We don't know how to program that by hand, that would be crazy. Um, but at the same time, we also don't know how to directly program in machine code anymore either. Really. Right. Um, and so I think there's a, a nice analogy that you can make between this fast executable representation of behaviors, which would be something like the weights of a neural network and the goals that we optimize in order to get those behaviors, which would be the data set that captures our notion of what a picture of a cat is. Interesting. So the, the um, I guess one of the interesting consequences of this sort of analogy too is it maps on well to the subjective experience of somebody who's trying to program for the first time and somebody who's trying mm -hmm. to do a kind of naive machine learning. So like when I program for the first time, I would get really frustrated with the machine because I would tell it to do things and my code would break. The machine would be telling me absolutely unambiguously, hey, you made a mistake. And I couldn't accept that. I, I, I kept thinking right. like, well, no, I didn't make a mistake. Clearly, you're not interpreting what I asked you to do correctly. Um, right. Of course, I now recognize that as a silly category of error. But it seems like we're making similar kinds, of, or at least we're, it's possible for us to make similar kinds of mistakes on machine learning where we're taken literally and not sort of, not seriously, let's say, by the machine. Is, is that, it, would that be a, a fair mapping between the two in terms of where the alignment problem comes from? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think it's kind of like before you have really good compilers, you work on benchmark code. Right? You don't know what programs people are interested in writing and you write compilers that work on your best representations of them um, and their particular uh, programs that are meant to replicate certain types of loads that you might need to compile for like fast data access in memory management or something like that. Um, but ultimately they're synthetic problems. And mm -hmm. if you look at AI, that, well, there is a genu genuine, I think, scientific interest in what is intelligence and, and those types of questions. Um, but practically, if you think about what we're actually using these systems for, we have data sets that are our representation of here are the kinds of things we'd like to be able to do, um, which is good and really, really useful, but it doesn't help us practice the process of here's how we take a really loose idea of what we want and then agree on how to represent that in some way that we can actually train a system to do what we want with it. And what kinds of best practices are now emerging or maybe what kinds of strategies are, are you working on to make that process easier? Like how do we help humans better specify what they want so that robots don't go off and do the wrong thing? Um, honestly, I think a big part of it is, re is redefining kind of what the role is of someone working in machine learning or like working as a machine learning engineer, let's say. Mm. Um, we like, if you think about what you learn on your like intro ML course, like you walk in, it's like day one standard supervised learning. Um, like I, I remember yeah. this pretty well for me. And like the first day it's like, well, machine learning, a supervised learning problem consists of a data set, a set of labels, a loss mm -hmm. function, a hypothesis class, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of what defines the problem. And that's really good, but it's sort of like saying, well, a program is defined by a set of terms that like come from some grammar and they rep, you know, it's your job to convert that faithfully into machine code. Um, it is accurate, but it doesn't focus on the aspect of actually making these systems work, which are often mm -hmm. related to how you actually get your data, making sure that the data labeling processes are actually tied to the causal mechanisms in the world that you care about. Uh, monitoring a data stream and making sure that the data doesn't shift over time. And I think ultimately there's this question of how do you build a system uh, with humans and robots as a part of it 
that ultimately ensures that the behavior the system exhibits represents something that we can tie towards the person's goals. Um, and that doesn't sound like a super concrete uh, recommendation, but I, th I think that part of it is just a recognition of how many problems can be solved by being more careful about where you get your data, how you label your data, and how you actually approach problems. So one of my classic examples here has to do with hiring scenarios, where you can look at this problem and you can say, well, I'm going to, I think, well, what does it mean to hire well? Uh, well, I guess I want people that do well in performance reviews. So I want to learn to predict who's going to get good performance reviews. And I think this sounds reasonable. If you're not thinking super carefully about yeah. what that represents and kind of how that uh, relates to the history of your company or your country or different contexts, mm -hmm. that's like a perfectly fine approach. I think if you think about it a little more, what you start to realize is that actually encodes to how can we hire the people that we would have wanted to hire in the past? Right. Which is a really interesting question, but probably not what you should optimize in order to hire the people that you want to hire now. Or, or certainly something you should think really carefully about assuming transfers between the past and now. Things arise in terms of like hiring biases, which you have companies that had existing biased systems for evaluating candidate employees. The companies then went and invested a ton of time in who they hired and how they did their training and how they did their hiring processes in order to remove this aspect of bias. And then at the same time, you bring in systems trained to replicate that bias yeah. uh, and introduce that in a new way. And I think that's a failure to really think through the important part of what actually is the problem that I'm solving rather than say, focusing on like, what's the AUC that I can get uh, with my model, which, which is ultimately where you're going to get to. And quite frankly, is an easier thing to measure. And if you're, yeah. an engineer within a company and you're trying to make a case for promotion that's gonna like having something like that to, to make your case with is certainly what you want to aim for and it's much harder to describe and quantify the work of making sure that we actually are solving the problem we really wanted to solve in the first place and well this very much seems to invite um some thought about good arts law and and just the idea that you know the moment that you the moment that you define a metric that you want to optimize, it ceases to be a metric that's worth optimizing for because people find clever hacks around it. Um, I, I guess one, one concern I have with respect to the application of Goodhart's law here is, does that imply that, does it imply that this is an intractable problem of even trying to identify a loss function that we should be striving towards in the long term? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, well, so, so at a high level, um, should we talk about kind of what good arts law is and, and actually yeah, go into that a little bit? So to my understanding, uh, good arts law is this idea that, for example, uh, the moment, let's say you, you pick a metric that you want to optimize for, like followers on Twitter, um, you might think on day one that this is going to cause you to engage in the kinds of behaviors that you would associate with the people you admire. If I have a lot of followers on Twitter, I will become a person that I admire. But then you realize, the more you think about it, the more time and energy you spend on trying to optimize the crap out of that metric, you start to realize there are little clever hacks that you can apply. You can play a follow, follow back game, or you can uh, say outrageous things on Twitter that get you more followers, even if it doesn't help you move the needle on the thing you originally wanted to do. And I guess the idea here is AI systems, as they become more sophisticated, as they in particular start to completely outstrip human performance on solving almost arbitrary tasks, will be able to put in compute cycles that just dwarf human ability to like overfit to particular metrics. And eventually you get to the point where you get outrageous solutions almost no matter what loss function you specify. It, it, no matter how much time you might put into thinking of an, an objective function that you'd like to optimize, the machine will find a way to do it so well that it transcends the initial purpose of the program. Um, right. So I that. think that is a, that's a, a good summary and I, I think covers a, a pretty broad spectrum. So like, 
I think let's put the relationship between good arts law and AI to the side first mm -hmm. and just focus on, on kind of good arts law and actually uh, how that shows up with people, because mm -hmm. that is ultimately where it arises from. Um, it was formulated because um, good art was actually talking about the inability to have effective monetary policy, um, which is a, a little bit strange, but it, it was basically saying that um, in some ways people have their own goals and objectives. And if you change a metric, you're unlikely to actually meaningfully shift their behavior and they will just adapt. And so you'll see kind of the smallest possible shift to make your metric go up that doesn't actually change right. what they're doing. I think as it's been interpreted sort of more broadly by people within AI uh, safety in particular and AI systems and, and social science generally, there's an observation that its particular statement, which is that an observed statistical correlation uh, when put under optimization pressure, or I may be getting the details of it wrong, uh, will we'll cease to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you take that in its more general form, you get this observation that writing down a reward function or specifying your objectives is brittle. Right. Um, and I think in many ways, this is something that we deal with all the time in our regular, like in our lives to some extent, we all have different incentive schemes that we're either subject to or uh, that we, uh, depending on your situation that you might impose on others. I mean, as if you teach students, you, you think a lot about incentive schemes that you, you put in place and yep. uh, the implications of those. And it's, um, I also think if you have employees and you think about how you measure their in performance, mm -hmm. uh, that also brings up similar questions. And you can think about the implications of different ways of measurement and the ways that people will uh, work around them. There's some sort of default bias in what they want and, and they'll shift their behavior somewhat. But in many cases, if someone trusts you, you can shift their behavior towards what you want yeah. uh, without having to use incentives. And incentives are very brittle is kind of my summary. Um, there's a way that you can, uh, a small amount of error in an objective that you specify can somehow seemingly be amplified. That's interesting. So it, would you say it's the amplification of the error or the fact that the error um, is put in sharper and sharper relief as you approach a, approach a peak in parameter space? So like, I guess the way I'm trying to imagine this, and, and please correct me if I'm completely off mm -hmm. base here, but um, so I'm imagining an artificially intelligent system which is trying to, basically it's an optimizer, it's trying to climb a peak in parameter space. We hope that the apex of that peak is going to coincide with an outcome that we actually genuinely deeply want. So, you know, I, I tell my AI, I want you to, I want you to make the stock market go up, for example, might be the loss function that I assign it. Mm -hmm. But what I really want is I want it to make all humans really, really happy. Right. And so sure. initially in the dark ages, when everything is absolute garbage, um, it really seems like the peak of that, that stock market landscape coincides with making people happy because from far away, the difference between make the stock market really high and make all human beings really happy seems to be pretty small in relative terms. But it's only as we start to climb that we notice, whoa, there's this like big divergence that starts to appear between these two goals. Is, is that an I accurate mean, I, frame? I, I think that that somewhat is there, although it, it's, I'm not sure that that helps for for building intuition, like, like, yeah. I don't know, like the, one of the big things about like make all people happy as a goal is that there's lots of people and people disagree about yeah. even the ways that you could come to agreement over some way to represent what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that brings in a layer of complexity yeah, that sure. we might want to, to um, sidestep for now, let's say. Um, but I think there is just, a nature of like, if you imagine teaching to the test is mm -hmm. probably one of the more intuitive things of, to some extent, studying for the SATs does help you become a little bit smarter or become better at certain types of math. Yeah. There are certain things you have to get better at. 
overall. But once you hit a certain point, which I think most people trying to apply to colleges hit in some way, studying for that does not help make you better at anything other than being good at that test. Yeah. Right. And I think it's that, uh, that feeling that really drives these things. And if we want to think about AI systems, there are some really clear examples that we've actually really dealt with already as a field. Um, I, for me, I think the biggest one is overfitting. So if we think about what overfitting is, it's the observation that, well, you would like to optimize for true risk. Yeah. You don't have true risk though. You have empirical risk. And for a while, optimizing empirical risk is helpful. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it's not. Right. And after a while, it becomes entirely unrelated uh, from true risk. And if you think about it, uh, a lot of the work that we've done on regularization in prediction is about coping for and overcoming this misalignment between empirical and true risk. And we have theorems about convergence that tell us here's a class of reward functions that we assume we can sample from iteratively by drawing new samples from a fixed distribution. And we know that that class in the limit trends towards the objective that we care about. And, and so in this sense, it's, it's kind of like a, a set of objectives that ultimately trends towards the objective that you care about in a rigorous mathematical way. And so this would be in the limit of like, of large amounts of data that, that are exactly like, precisely. And guess, yeah. And large guess, amounts of labeled data, which is right. a really important distinction well, here. Yeah. And, and this seems like it really brings us to some of your research in, in a, a, an interesting kind of sideways sort of way. Um, we're bandwidth constrained. I think it's fair to say in terms of our interaction with machines, it would be great if humans could provide feedback on how machines are performing the tasks that we ask them to do in a super fast way so that we could make sure every task that they do is, you know, perfectly supervised. We can't. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess a lot of your research is involved in answering the question, you know, how can we make this happen more efficiently? How can we mm -hmm. um, get humans in the loop in, in more constructive ways? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. I, I think my, so my research is about looking at a human and a robot working on a team. Mm -hmm. I think when we do this work we, or, and when we look at hypothetical agents, there's this thing you have to do, which is to draw the line around what counts as the agent mm. and what counts as the environment. Um, and a lot of our modeling for AI systems and a lot of the way we think about it, the agent is a robot of some kind, is some prediction system. Um, and my research asks the question, what does it look like if we draw that box around the person and the robot? Um, mm. So this is modeling a particular type of um, human robot system where you have partial information about what the true goal is, about how to actually accomplish that. Um, and you have to communicate that through some sort of noisy channel. Mm -hmm. uh, in general actions, the person could be taking. So this could be, you communicate it through demonstrations of behavior, which have to get imitated in new context. Um, you could also imagine this would be natural language or it could be a labeled data set of some kind. Um, and my research looks at how can you combine those systems in a way that efficiently accomplishes goals. Now, what would this actually look like in practice? Um, one particular idea that I've looked at is one called inverse reward design, which takes, I think, the simplest version of this type of interaction that we use and tries to look at, at one additional layer of complexity in how the human robot interacts. The idea here is you observe a reward function and you know that, you know two things really. One is that this reward function is not actually the true goal. There's some way in which it's, it's wrong and which it's misaligned. Um, and two, it is yet a really good source of information about what you should be doing at any point in time. Mm. So good, but imperfect. Exactly, and so how do you actually recognize the types of errors that are going to be likely. And mm -hmm. the first thing that you look at in this problem is recognize that on its own, you can't answer this. 
if, it, if all I tell you is here's a reward function, it could be wrong and you yeah. don't know anything else, there's nothing you can do with that. Um, so what I did in this work is we brought in the idea of context for a metric. So you have an existing set of options that you're choosing between and you have a metric that you're selecting, which your commitment basically to the system is this metric leads to good behavior in these sets of environments or contexts. Okay. And now this gives you some uh, information that's, that's more structured. Mm -hmm. What you can do is actually say that this metric is a way of specifying a ranking over different behaviors. And I can treat this as an observed ranking of behaviors. And from that infer the likelihood of new behaviors uh, in different settings, or more usefully actually to figure out when the distribution over how those behaviors extrapolate to new settings is uh, if it's very, very tight, you have high confidence that, oh, this is a similar environment to the one my design that the system designer had in mind. And so I can behave appropriately. Or if it's very broad, you can say, ah, this is, this is bad. I should probably not go over there and, and choose to either go get more information um, or to uh, pick an alternative, perhaps safer course of action. Uh, so an example that... that we use for this is like, um, uh, we call it's a setting where you're trying, you've got a robot that's trying to drive uh, between some 2D environment. You've got some different types of phenomena that you want it to go observe. So imagine there are like something like pots of gold throughout the environment that you want to seek out. And for the environments you have in mind, there's really two types of terrain there's grass and dirt. There's like dirt paths, and then there's lawns and things. And you want it to mostly stay on dirt, find these objects, uh, and cut across the lawns where it has to. Um, now, you would do this by collecting examples of each of these types of terrain, examples of the pots of gold that you want to go and seek out, training classifiers, and then specifying a reward function that uses those classifiers, basically. Mm. Um, problem is, if you forgot that your robot was going to be deployed in Hawaii, and so there's actually lava as well, everything kind of goes haywire. Right. And you, you, you actually, you won't have a consistent prediction for what it should do with lava because there's no, there's, there's no clear implication of that based off the data you've seen, or, or probably not. It all depends on the feature space and biases of the learning algorithms that you're using. But the point is it's kind of arbitrary what it does in that situation. Um, if you look at a bunch of metrics and they all say different, they all would say the same thing in a world with no lava and wildly different things in a world oh, with lava, that gives you an idea that perhaps my metric is not very well adapted to this environment. So this seems like it's, uh, it introduces almost a dose of, of humility and introspection to the system where you kind of first look at your environment and say, okay, well, like how, you know, how much can I really map my, like, love of my Hawaii experience to my San Francisco experience? And I guess, what do you, what do you, um, what conclusions does the robot or the AI tend to draw based on that? Like, would it tend to say, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to take any action because I'm uncertain maybe if I'm in a new environment that doesn't map well onto what I've seen before, or is that sort of left as an exercise to the, to the developer? Um, I, I think in, in a very kind of humble way, it's left as an exercise to the developer in the yeah. sense that it's not my place to specify. And I think actually one of the, the important things that's come out of this work is what things should you be careful about specifying as the developer? And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that actually falls out of the math in this case in a really nice way is specifying a fallback behavior for when you are too uncertain. Um, I don't know what level of mathematical detail uh, your listeners will want. Yeah, we, we, might, um, we might keep it reasonably high level, I guess, to, just so that, but, but if you have a... But yeah. I, I think that the, the high level version of it is um, there. So uh, would you say that people would be familiar with the idea of identifiability within a probabilistic model? Um, Perhaps. I think it's, I, I, I'm okay. not fully, so maybe, maybe we can so, start there. So identifiability is the question of what can you actually figure out about latent variables within a model from data. So the classic example of this is if you have a mixture of Gaussians uh, that are drawn from some, and you have some 
uh, latent variables that are the mean and uh, variances of those Gaussians. When you do clustering, you observe this data and then you fit these latent variables. Yeah. And in the limit of infinite data, you can prove that you will identify the correct means and covariances um, on average. Like with, with infinite amounts of data, you, you will eventually get there. So is this However, like, can I reconstruct the parameters of a neural network based on the outputs, the predictions that I... Okay. Sort of. So, so the thing is the mean, the values of the means are identifiable, mm -hmm. but the ordering of them in that latent, in that vector of latent variables is not. Oh, right. So yeah. there's a bunch of parallel hypotheses that will all get equal weight mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. final uh, inference. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that, I mean, that intuitively makes sense in the sense that I would imagine there would be mul like a, in fact, a potentially infinite number of neural networks that would produce the same input output profile. Right. So, so like, or, or functions in general, sorry, I'm saying neural networks, but functions. Sure. In yeah. And it, it, yeah, you could, you could use anything in here, but the point is if you have two identical setting, two different settings of the latent variables mm -hmm. that produce the same distribution over data, you can never figure out from observation which one right. is actually the case. Right. And this is a very general concept known as identifiability. Mm -hmm. It's the, the study of what can you figure out based off of assumed causal structures in your data. Interesting. That seems almost, I mean, so it seems to point to a problem in, in that um, I could imagine, like, let's say two different neural networks, uh, one of which gives exactly the results I want, like, maximizes human value or whatever I mean by that. And then mm -hmm. the other of which is like really pathologically uh, awful, but in ways that I just can't detect with the particular samples that I feed it. Um, it's, it's possible for an arbitrarily large set of, of those algorithms to exist, most of which will behave pathologically, but I can only er ever check their behavior on like a finite number of samples, right? So does that speak to like the verifiability almost of, of alignment? I mean, I think that's getting into questions like the no free lunch theorem right. with prediction, right? If you, if you are asking questions about out of distribution performance, we, we don't have good ways about giving guarantees without additional assumptions. And you know that those assumptions will help in some cases and they must necessarily hurt in others. Right. Um, and I think this is just the same kind of thing. Now, I think, I, I think my, my overall perception is that rationality and the, and the idea that behaviors should be optimized towards an objective is actually a choice. Mm -hmm. And it's a tool for how we design compilers that, that take in these representations of goals and these representations of desired behaviors and communicate them. Um, but I think it doesn't need to be the only property that we have. What, what right? are some if you, if the you other think, options? Well, I think, I think the first thing to say is like, if you think about rationality, it's a, it's a high level heuristic of someone wrote down an objective. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it turns out most behaviors you could do are dumb. Like most right. neural nets don't do anything useful. Um, and bringing in this idea of optimizing towards accomplishing some task, like this paradigm basically builds in a heuristic of at least do something. Right. And this kind of reduces the program, like the space of, <laughs> programs that you have to work with to represent what you want because yeah. rather than needing to distinguish between all of the little details of how things are worked out you can say well do this in a way that's reasonable or, or tries to optimize some set of goals mm -hmm. um, I think you can also say well we don't really want purely rational behavior at the end of the day we'd like to have more regularized behavior mm -hmm. and I think that's something to include within a spec um, if you think about it, you don't, we don't write supervised learning systems that optimize empirical risk directly uh, by default. In, in some settings, it works if you have enough data and you can rely on, you can still rely on other physical properties to regularize the ultimate behavior. And mm -hmm. in many ways, we do actually rely on the computational restraints of our systems to regularize their behavior. Um, like in theory, there is a really, really good strategy for every RL environment ever, which is to somehow do like a buffer overflow attack and write a really large register, write a really large number to wherever in memory 
yeah, like that wire reward heading. calculation comes from, right? And the reason why our systems don't do that is, on the one hand, really obvious, but very hard to explain, right? Like it's, it's, not, it, it's not clear that there are easy strategies within a particular set of weights that would do that. Um, and I think we're confident that actually there are properties of the types of optimization techniques we use that mean that that wouldn't be what we wind up at. Oh, really? Um, okay. Because I, I thought like why? I don't, well, was... I don't think we know how to describe them, but mm. it's uh, like I don't think anyone's realistically worried that an optimization that you're running currently is going to somehow go off the rails. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I've I've seen sort of I've seen people explore the possibility of like scaled language models, for example, as potential um, potential risk factors in the sense that you know take a, a GPT four gpt 10 or whatever and you know you keep making the neural network larger and deeper it starts by learning low levels of abstraction and like you know basic how to put letters together and whatnot eventually grammar and so on and then eventually it develops a model of the world uh, of some kind that model may eventually come to include a recognition of the model's own place within the world it might go oh look at that like because it's instrumentally useful to predicting the next word in, in a, a sentence um, I'm going to realize that, hey, I'm actually embedded in this world. And therefore, along with that, kind of start to get greedy. And I mean, there are all kinds of... It's, right. This is like changing the world so that it's easier to predict the next word. Right. And I guess this plays with what you've been talking about is, is this distinction between, you know, the agent and the environment. I mean, like this would be the, a moment in which the algorithm sort of realizes, hey, I'm actually like... I'm embedded in an environment here and it's time to start blurring those lines. Um, I, I think like, so I, I think these arguments always like the, these sort of like perspectives, I think are both worth taking seriously, but also very hard to actually refute. Um, and that, I think that's something to take seriously and and to to you should bring an appropriate level of skepticism to yeah. them i think in that way um for example there's an assumption that like basically if the only character is it well let me, let me put it this way we have lots of examples uh from economics that rational behavior is weird and counterintuitive and fundamentally not human, I think, in, in a lot of ways, right? Like mm -hmm. homo economicus yeah. is, is a different uh, type of being. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if the only assumption you make about AI systems is that they are an instantiation of homo economicus with an arbitrary utility function, that's bad. Like, like you, you will end up with bad outcomes um, because you are hypothesizing a scenario that uh, I, I think basically by, by assumption kind of can't work out very well. That's interesting. And I mean, I, I guess, well, I guess it'd be almost impossible by definition to figure out exactly where, I mean, if we could figure out where that assumption failed, we'd know a, a whole bunch more things. But um, to my mind, the, the reason homo economicus doesn't work is that evolution has programmed us with wants and desires that are, um, well, we're kind of uh, not random, but very misaligned with economic incentives. So we, we want to do things like we're jealous of people sometimes. We, um, we value in pathological modes of human being, human existence, we sometimes value other people's suffering more than our own happiness if we get vengeful or whatever, and that kind of throws off the whole the whole model. Um, in the case of a, in the case of I guess a a machine learning model or say a deep neural network, that's essentially unconstrained by those evolutionary conditions. I guess you might say effectively it's undergoing a process of evolutionary optimization. So maybe that. Um, so so I think there. Like, I, I don't think anyone can tell me that we can't figure out how to program something that fits that behavior profile or that is well-modeled. 
by um, something like a an optimal rational agent or or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying I think that's impossible. And I'm saying that I think if we did build that, I'm not, I don't think it would be good in a bunch of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I just, and I think that some people can, can talk about that through existential risk. Mm-hmm. I think there's like, you, you don't necessarily even need to get to that to really talk about pretty just like bad outcomes that something like that would lead to. Yeah. Um, oh, I- I totally agree. I mean, this is something that like, to, to be clear, like I, I actually frame this as an extremely, or think of this as an extremely dangerous category of outcomes when we start to talk about breakout risk and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, I, but I think that that is the thing that I push back on is that that's what AI systems or the outcome of AI research has to be. Hmm. This is like, there's a step that these argue that arguments like this take, which is to say, uh, that is a model of what future AI systems will be. And I think if you, if you will go with me again on this kind of compiler analogy, yeah. at some point in the, along the way, there was an innovation in building these systems, which was to bring in these models of optimal behavior and to say, we should make our compiler more likely to put, output things that at least do something useful, hmm. right? And, and that has been really useful for making progress within AI research and AI systems. But that doesn't mean that we have to push that line of research through to its uh, eventual completion or that AI systems necessarily need to work in the direction of individually rational economic agents. Um, I think there are a lot of people who, quite frankly, want to build that. Yeah. Um, And I think that's not great. I think that comes out of a certain type of mindset. Um, but I don't think it's inevitable. I think that's a choice. And actually, I think the outcome of looking at these arguments about risk is uh, what actually are the appropriate directions to go in and right. what are useful alternatives there. And this is where I actually feel kind of hopeful because the problems that AI systems are running into as we try to deploy them in the world right now, um, to some extent, are these types of issues. They're They're not necessarily issues of prediction error, although I, I think you could you could argue that they are that way, but they're issues of not being able to appropriately represent the minimum viable product of goals for lots of important settings and not producing practitioners who are trained in uh, doing the hard work of thinking deeply about what those goals are as a process of representing them inside of a machine learning system. I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree that uh, it would be great if we could avoid the, the kind of circumstance in which people mindlessly um, kind of move towards this sort of super juiced up model. I guess my concern is that economically, it seems like there's a powerful forcing function in that direction. And that if, like, if we take the example, okay, this toy example of a super scaled up deep neural network that's more massive than anything we've ever built, um, the people who are trying to make like, I, I won't call it GPTN because that makes it sound like I'm singling out open AI. I, I don't think, I think they're approaching this like with, with a lot of the risks in mind, but um, somebody who tries to make whatever that massive model looks like, like might actually like, they might not be trying to overfit. They might be trying to do the best job they can at like coming up with a reasonable loss function that produces just a really powerful model and not know at what level of training, at what level of abstraction does the model decide to break out? So they, they might even be approaching it you know, with a safety conscious mindset, um, but because we have no way of really predicting at what point that jump, that abstraction leap will be, will be made, it becomes an inherently dangerous thing to push in that direction. Right, and, and so I'm not, to be clear, I'm not disagreeing with that concern on a material level Mm -hmm. like i think we can be concerned that that is an issue and i have not seen any genuine arguments that convince me that that's not likely to happen i think there are intuitive arguments there are people's perceptions of what's possible based off of 
uh, either experience building systems or intuition in, from some other way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there are any actual solid arguments you could point me to to convince me that that's not an issue. And quite frankly, if, if that exists and someone knows about it, I, I would love to see it. Um, yeah. I think my point is at the same time, I think we can recognize that, recognize that that is a challenge. And then also wonder what is a more serious form of proof that that is something to be concerned about with current systems, right? It, all of the arguments that I've seen sort of suggesting risk or, or four different ways of things like we will talk about ideas like breakout or something like that. Like I don't, that's not really how I try to think about these things because I don't know how to make that idea precise. I don't know how to define that idea. Um, and I don't know how to do anything useful with that representation. And again, this is something where if someone can figure out a good formalism, a good way to represent this, to model this, I, I think that's good. But I'm not, I'm not sure where it comes in. And the arguments for it rely on rational behavior as the axiom for how your AI system functions, right? The, the, the claim is that it would break out because that's better for the objective as you have it represented within the system. And mm -hmm. on the one hand, I think that's true if you accept the assumption that it's good to model this as this homo economicus. Yeah. Um, but I also want to know, okay, are there any other assumptions that actually do lead to that? And mathematically, are there ways to build systems that are not actually purely optimizing their objectives? I think in practice, this is certainly true, mm. right? Like it, like we have regularization. We can train things that make the best use of an empirical data set to make predictions on the true uh, distribution of data that, that led to that. And we can tailor that to the data set size. And that's something that you have to do, right? No one can tell you what number to set your regularization yeah. parameter at or the particular details, but we recognize this as a problem. And we know that overcoming it is a central part of building an AI system. I think there is exactly the same kind of thing that shows up maybe one additional layer of abstraction higher, which is related to okay, what is the actual human cognitive process that you want to try to imitate in the case mm -hmm. of supervised learning, right? Um, and, if you, like, and, and here we are heavily, heavily biased as practitioners and as a field towards what is available rather than what do we need. Right, which is, I mean, a general problem, I guess, with all these systems. It's, it, I think so. It, yeah, and it's kind of interesting how, how much of an interaction there is between like the the safety of the system and then its overall abilities. Cause like, it'd be wonderful to be able to fully leverage all of the capacity of a neural network towards some objective. But at the end of the day, like anytime we talk about safety, that has to mean imposing some kind of constraint. Like the moment you start to let go of those, of those, um, uh, of that harness, you sort of, you venture I mean, into I, it. I would, so I would kind of question that, that assumption almost like in, in the sense that, Okay, if we can assume a perfect world, you'd like to squeeze every last bit of performance right. out of the system. But um, there's kind of that, there's the Warren Buffett line about good employees. It's you, you want people with like, uh, some, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting it wrong, but it's like you want people with intelligence, grit, and trustworthiness. And then if they don't have the last one, watch out for the first two. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, does actually apply here in practical senses, not for far off systems, but for current systems. Like mm. you would be okay with except like if, for instance, if you went to YouTube right now and you told them, I have a way for you to, uh, you will do a worse job of predicting how well someone will click, well, how likely someone is to click on this particular video. But yeah. I can guarantee you that um, it doesn't have a negative impact on well-being, uh, on the well-being of teenagers as measured by, um, institutes A, B, and C. Yeah. If, if you went to them and were able to specify that, that would be, that's like an incredibly valuable thing, I think. Mm -hmm. And 
that's something that you are not going to be able to fix by just simply relabeling the data that you have. Um, you might be able to get at it by fundamentally redesigning the types of interactions that people have with your video recommendation system. Um, but it's, uh, there's a problem that they want to be solving that they're unable to solve. Yeah. They're unable to specify. And the barriers between being able to effectively make use of this technology are not really, I think, improved prediction performance, but it's actually improved ability to easily specify goals. Right, which I guess, that, yeah, that's kind of the thing, right? It's like you, because you haven't specified the exact optimization objective that you want, you're then forced to take steps to kind of limit the behavior of the system as a whole using like more kind of coarse grained instruments. So you're basically finding a, a hammer to, to beat your neural network with a little bit. I mean, I, I think about it. I, I think that's kind of right. It's, it's sort of like you have this large set of behaviors which in, consist of different parameterizations of a neural network, let's say, and you're trying to figure out how to pick out the right one. Mm -hmm. That's something that a person can't do on their own. We figured out that specifying some sort of metric and then optimizing these uh, predictive losses is a good way to actually um, prune out a whole bunch of these weight configurations that are just bad. Yeah. Um, and but not I all think of there's them still, but, but not all of the wrong ones. And it actually turns out that if yeah. you focus too much, then most, you have a very high probability of getting something wrong in a different way. Rather, like there's sort of one end of the spectrum, you have useless random behavior. Um, yeah. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have, uh, with probability one, you probably don't actually have the behavior you want. So this is something that, um, yeah, the idea that there may not actually exist a, an objective um, loss function or, or an objective function rather that, that humanity might want to optimize towards is, I don't know, for, for people who believe in like something like AI absolutism or the fact that eventually AI will be doing pretty well everything, a little, a little concerning. I mean, and, you know, it, like, there's, um, you know, Sam Harris, for example, has this the book, The Moral Landscape, and he talks there about essentially what is an objective function that he believes exists out in the wild. Um, but that all, it always seems underspecified to me. Anytime somebody speaks about morality in that, in that way, uh, do you think that there actually, like, may be something that we could optimize to, I don't even know what I'm going to say here, make people happy, maximize human flourishing? I don't necessarily subscribe to that set of beliefs about where things will end up. Mm. What I'm interested in is what are the systems that we can set up to recreate some of the balancing of incentives that we have in human societies and to um, incorporate that into AI systems in general. And I, I think to some extent, this is a question of, what are the processes that we can as people put in place to argue about those things to mm. um to some extent matt like i don't know to try to replicate the processes that we've built and designed as a species in order to regulate group behavior and um coordinate ourselves at scale right um i think there is this aspect of we figured out how to balance a lot of different incentives within, within mm -hmm. us individually, um, as like, and, and sort of as, as societies and structures. Right. Um, there are ways of like having a trusted third party or the idea of having an agent, right? Like an agent is already a job. Someone yeah. can be your agent. You can hire someone in like the real estate market to be your agent and represent your interests. Mm -hmm. And, that's like that didn't come out of nowhere someone invented that as yeah. a way to manage the complexity of the world and we can also be doing that with with ai systems right like we, we need to figure out what that looks like like what is your agent that can be trusted to act on your behalf in setting your settings on like facebook for what types of content you want to see and when you want to see different kinds of things but um, do you think this can be do you think this kind of picture of kind of robot human interaction can be maintained in a world where 
robots, machines are doing things that are so complex that human beings wouldn't even be able to understand like the implications of those decisions? Um, I think that's a really tough question. Um, I, I think the more kind of mundane version of it is how do you present people information in appropriate context to give them the best way to make decisions that they can? Hmm. Um, and this includes like, how do you provide appropriate context about what the consequences of that decision will be? Right. And that, that is something that we don't know how to do. Like I keep coming, I've been thinking a lot about how value alignment relates to recommendation systems in general and hmm. uh, content recommendation systems like YouTube and Facebook specifically. So I, that's kind of why I, it seems like I keep coming back to those examples. Um, that's, that's part of why. Um, but we're not very good at, at figuring out how to get someone into a state where they can think reflectively about what type of things they want to engage with on the internet. Right. And um, so my, my perspective on this question is, well, yeah, there, it is true that we could imagine possible systems in a far off future and, and talk about that. But, but realistically, it's like, okay, for something like the, something that's a new thing that exists with this, which is this weird type of content feed yeah. uh, that's algorithmically filtered and selected for you. Um, what is like, most people are not even kind of aware of like the appropriate terminology for, for what yeah. that is, like what the recommendations are. It's really interesting for me when I like go out and, and uh, occasionally run, it doesn't happen too much anymore, but you occasionally run into people and I would all often ask them about uh, their recommendations and, and everyone has different theories of ways of anthropomorphizing the recommendations that they yeah. get or the rankings that they get and what it's figured out about them and how it works. And they're always really convinced about them and they're usually wrong in some way. Yeah. Uh, which is fine because no I'm one sure mine would be. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty complicated what's actually happening behind the scenes. Like I, you know, as someone who's not at either of those companies, I'm not that aware yeah. of what's happening <laughs> behind the scenes really. Um, and so the fact that there is something like your information filter or this ranking algorithm that's selecting what you see and that has implications for the person that you will be, the types of news consumption that you'll have, what kinds of things should you care about in that? Should you care about balance? Should you, like fairness, like a whole, there's a whole bunch of like different values that you might care about having represented there. Yeah. And the question is really, how do you begin to have that conversation? How do you, and, and this is a combination of like public education, mm -hmm. like helping people know that there actually is a problem there and designing systems around providing context, helping people recognize problems they should be solving, helping them recognize the value of the cognitive work you're actually asking them to do. I think right. one of the, the big ironies here is there actually are a ton of tools and controls you have. Like, um, it's very interesting to go and see people say on Twitter that they wish Twitter had a way to see yeah. things less often. Like I've seen this many times from like Twitter power users, like people with check marks and lots of followers and things. And the reality is Twitter has that feature. Mm -hmm. It's there. I don't know how long it's been there, but it's there. Yeah. And yeah. the thing is just no one knows what it actually is going to do or how to trust that it's actually going to help them in the future. Um, well, and it, it's also, I guess, this interesting question of like, you know, even if you, even if you knew exactly how this recommender system worked and you knew exactly, you know, everything was open source or whatever, you'd still have this really complicated moral question about who you want to be. And, you know, I, like I can spot a, a YouTube video that is pregnant with the potential of turning me into a, um, a brilliant, uh, I don't know, like marine biologist. Uh, and I could just follow that rabbit hole and, and keep following videos. And there's probably, a, in fairness, a sequence of videos that I could watch that would actually do that. Um, but am I in a position to know which version of me I, I would want to be? If I'm faced with that option or another option that takes me to machine learning engineer as, as a, a final end state or, or whatever right. else, or, or one that takes me to become a Nazi or a communist or, or whatever else, it, it seems like I mean, like, I don't know who the future versions of me would want me to be if they knew what all the different future versions of me would want me to be. I don't even know where this is going. Right. This is where you get into some pretty 
complex philosophy and yeah. that, like there you you can talk about ways to to think about it i'm certainly not the right person to answer yeah. those questions for anyone but myself um but i think the observation that I, I i think most people would agree on is it is cognitively taxing to answer those yeah. questions like there is a fundamental cognitive work that goes into answering the questions of who do i want to be yeah and so in in some ways you you have to figure out how to design the system to overcome um not just the informational problem of you don't know who that person wants to be or like what types of or you know to make it more concrete like what content they want to see which is related to who they want to be like the fact you yeah. can influence this if you could just not influence who someone like say like i'm not going to influence who someone is tomorrow based off what i show them again that that might be something that you would actually want yeah um but you, like you don't know what that is as the designer of a recommendation system uh but beyond that the person doesn't often know the answer to that question perhaps doesn't even know how to really have that type of conversation or or doesn't like that type of reflective thinking of who i want to be is a particular style of thinking that not everyone likes to engage in um yeah. or or for me the way i think about it is that it, it is costly and differentially costly for different people yeah and so how do you convince people to go through this costly process when all they wanted to do is disappear into some cat videos for a moment? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, it's clear that there would be huge positive externalities. Like if we could wave, if I could wave a magic wand for society right now, it would probably be to get everyone to budget like 15 minutes a week to think reflectively about how they consume information and the types of information they want to consume and then to spend five minutes doing something that like sets them up for success based off that i think if everyone did that it would be a huge huge positive externality for society yeah right because there would be the individual change that you would have for your personal information consumption but the compounding effects right of oh yeah that actually shifting the overall and and actually steering and including certain types of cognitive processes into steering the information diet of a population right yeah i i just i can't get over i mean my most productive days are are always the ones i don't spend on twitter for example and it's definitely the case that like it, the way it feels right now is that the amount of time that we have to step away to do information processing relative to the amount of time we spend consuming information, the balance has just completely flipped in the last 10 years. Like it used to be you'd, you'd see one big news story in the day, you might spend the rest of the day chewing on it, maybe talking to a handful of people about that same focus story, um, in which case the reliability of that story mattered a lot more. Whereas now it's just like, it's just this nonstop input, 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 and very little time for cognitive processing. Uh, right. Sort of an interesting phase shift in, in the way things are, are happening. Um, well, and if you have a world where information is more scarce or harder to get requires that you actually like, I mean, it, it sounds a little silly, but if you have to choose to go and grab a newspaper, yeah. there, there's something about that, that action and that choice that, that commits you to it a little bit. It, it gets you into a slightly different state. Whereas if you just want to pull out, like if instead you're going to get information from a, I don't know what else to do. There's a scroll of things for like distraction. That's yeah. a very different kind of thing. Well, on that, uh, on that note, I'm going to hip hypocritically ask uh, if you have a, a Twitter link that you want to share, if people want to follow you there uh, to see more of your uh, Yeah, definitely. I'm uh, D. Hadfield Bunnell, uh, first initial, last name, uh, with no punctuation or anything else like that. I can't promise to tweet all that often. I'm currently actually taking a break, uh, nice. but I'll definitely be posting paper updates, and I tend to tweet on occasional AI ethics and uh, general value alignment topics. Awesome, well, really appreciate your time and uh, really fascinating, almost all encompassing discussion today. So really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be posting a link to your Twitter and I, th I think also your academic website as well, if that's okay. And the blog post that'll come to the podcast. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's a real opportunity and I appreciate the chance to talk to you guys.